Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom McNulty, and I'm here with our presenter, Aya Takase. Thank you all for attending Ragaku's webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. I'm very excited to see that we have attendees from over 22 countries today. This is our second segment, Data Analysis, and it will focus on the techniques and methods researchers use to retrieve quantitative data from CT images. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. We will be taking questions during the live webcast. We ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A button on your screen. We will not be monitoring the raised hand or chat features. We will be saving the questions submitted during the webcast and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, that said, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Aya Takase. Welcome, Aya. Thanks, Tom. Thank you everyone for joining us for the data analysis part of the webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. We're gonna learn a lot of technical terms today, but I would like to start with this one. RSI or repetitive strain injury. This is me some years ago when I was just starting to work on X-ray CT image analysis. Back then, I just didn't know any better and oftentimes I was manually segmenting different phases. I was literally painting those pixels by hand. And after doing this for several months, I hurt my hand. I got repetitive strain injury in my right thumb. Then two cortisone shots, a lot of reading and learning later, my hand got better. And I also learned a lot of better, smarter ways to analyze X-ray CT images. So today, I would like to share what I've learned over the years with you so that you don't need to make the same mistake or hurt your hand. In this webinar, you will learn what X-ray CT images are, how to segment them, and how to use segmented data for quantitative analysis. Let's start with the first question. What exactly are X-ray CT images? To analyze them, it's kind of important to understand what they are. This is a 3D rendered volume of a geological sample. It just looks like a cylinder shaped volume. And what this is, is a collection of a bunch of voxels. Voxels are just like pixels, but they're in 3D. And each voxel has an XYZ coordinate and the intensity or gray level value, which represents the relative density of that location. And those XYZ and intensity values can be saved in different data formats. And among them, TIFF and DICOM are the most commonly used formats. TIFF is a general file format you can use for materials or life science, and DICOM is a standard data format in medicine. So now you know that this volume is actually a bunch of voxels. And the file structure wise, the way it's saved is in the form of multiple slices. So you have a lot of 2D slices stacked on top of each other to create the 3D information. And this is why oftentimes on the CT scans are referred to as TIFF stacks. Now let's take a look at one of those slices. And I would like you to take a moment and look at this image and think about what you see. When we analyze images like those, we use computers. But think about this process is we humans in those computers or machines or robots, however you call them, we don't look at this image the same way. What we see in this image is something like, okay, I see one, two, three, four, maybe five phases. And we can do this very easily 
And knowing that this is a geological sample, some of you even could tell which phase is what. But what about those computers? When they look at the same image, what goes through their mind, if they have one, is more like this. So the question is, how are we gonna work together? We have to find some sort of common language between us. And computers might ask, do you speak binary? Well, we don't, at least most of us don't. But what about numbers? They can understand numbers. What about histograms? Well, they know histograms too. So this is a good place to start. Maybe we can use histograms as the common language. Now, what is a histogram? So let's take a look at this slice again. And we're gonna zoom into this image until you see the individual pixels. Then you can take the gray level as your x-axis and the number of pixels for each gray level as your y-axis. And you're gonna check those pixels one by one. This one, for example, is 30 to 41. So you put a little box in the graph. This one is 35, 36, and you just keep going. You're gonna check all those pixels. And eventually, you plot all those gray levels in the same graph. And this is a histogram of this original image. And then when you look at this histogram, you realize that there are two peaks. One is for the dark pixels and the one for the lighter pixels. And this means that you can simply set a threshold between those two peaks and say that all those pixels on the left side belong to phase A, those dark pixels phase A, and you map them back to the original image. You can do the same thing for the lighter gray pixels, phase B, and you map them back to the original image. And this is how you can segment this image into two different phases. So you can see how handy a histogram can come in when you're trying to segment different images into different phases. Now, let's zoom out to see the big picture. So this sample has five phases. By the way, this peak is coming from the air outside of the sample. Now for those five phases, you can set multiple thresholds or phase one, two, three, four, five, and a map all those pixels back to the original image. Now you just segmented this image into five different phases. And this is just one cross section or slice, but you can do this for the entire volume to segment this volume into five different phases. And at this point, you can calculate volume percentage, for example. And percentage calculation is probably the most commonly done quantitative analysis by X-ray CT. And there are a couple of different programs, software products you can use to do this type of data analysis. And I will go through the list towards the end of this webinar, but this one was done using Dragonfly by ORS. And the most of the examples you're gonna see today in this webinar were done using Dragonfly. Now, let's go through an example, another one. This is a computed tomography cross-section of a carbon fiber reinforced polymer. The mid-level gray is coming from the polymer and the light gray is coming from the fibers. And the dark gray is actually air, those are voids. So you can segment this image into three different phases. Then you can focus on one phase at a time. So let's take a look at the voids. And all those red pixels are voids but you see a couple of different groups or chunks of those red pixels. And you can label them as a separate objects. And at this point, you can check different properties like volume, surface area, or location of those objects and analyze them separately. For example, you can make a histogram of the void volume distribution to see how large of a voids you have and how many of them you have. 
in the same manner, you can look at the fibers and see the fiber orientation distribution. So this is the main flow of X-ray CT data analysis. To summarize, you start with the raw image and segment this image into different phases. And at this point, you are just labeling the pixels. Then you label individual objects that belong to the same phase. Then you can move on to all different kinds of quantitative analysis. The typical analysis include volume percentage analysis or object size, volume, surface area, aspect ratio. You can analyze all those different parameters. If you have fibers, you can do orientation distribution analysis. If you have some coatings or multi-layer structure, you can do layer thickness distribution analysis as well. Now, all those quantitative analysis of results would be good and accurate only if the original CT image you use has good quality. So if you have good quality CT image in, you're gonna have good analysis of results out. But if you have a poor quality image, then you're gonna have some nonsense out of it. It's a garbage in, garbage out. So obviously, the image quality is very important. Now, what exactly is the image quality? There are several different parameters or aspects that you can think of when you're describing image quality. But we're going to focus on a couple of them that are important for X-ray CT image analysis. Resolution is always important. And Contrast is also important. And the last one is the noise level. Now, when we say resolution, this term could mean a couple different things. For example, this is a really low resolution image, meaning the pixel size is way too large compared to the size of the feature you're trying to look at. So this is low resolution and considered to be bad quality. But what about this one? Now, the pixel size is small enough, but the image is kind of blur, so you still can't see what you're trying to see. So this is low resolution as well. What you're looking for is high resolution and sharp image. So this is the aspect of resolution. Now, what about contrast? This is a low contrast image you don't have a whole lot of variation of the gray level, which makes it difficult to see some features. This image is high contrast, but it's got its own problems. So you have only four levels of gray, black, dark gray, light gray, and white to describe the difference of density. So that is not enough of a dynamic range. So when you have a low dynamic range image like this one, that can cause some problems too. What you want is high contrast and high dynamic range image like this one. So this is the aspect of contrast. The last one is the noise level. So this is a really noisy image. You can barely see what's in it. This one is a little bit better. This one is a lot better. So when it comes to the noise level, the lower, the better. You want to be looking for a very low noise image. So resolution, contrast, and the noise level are the three important factors when you think about the image quality. And in ideal situation, you will have them all. But in reality, what if this is all you can get? Maybe your instrumentation is limited or your sample just happens to be difficult to image and you just can't get this ideal high quality image. And when this happens, actually computers can help a little bit. And of course there are things computers can do and cannot do. If you have an image like this one, really low resolution or low dynamic range, those images are fundamentally missing some information which cannot be recovered by computer processing. So they're not gonna look like this. But if you have an image like this, a little bit noisy or low contrast, 
they can look more like this image to some extent by applying image processing methods. So what is the image processing? There are many different kinds of image processing methods, including making yourself look prettier using Photoshop. But we're gonna focus on techniques that are useful in X-ray image analysis. The first one is contrast enhancement. So this image is pretty low contrast and its histogram looks like this. When you look at the histogram, you realize that all the bars are focused in a very narrow gray level area, and that's why it's so low contrast. But you can stretch this histogram from all the way from black to white like this. Then your image can look like this. So this is contrast enhancement. And we're doing this linearly in this case, but you can do this enhancement uh, non-linearly as well. Now let's talk about noise reduction. If your original data looks like this one, this is really noisy. You have a whole lot of high frequency noise. You can always blur it to reduce the noise level. You're essentially smoothing this image. And the way you do this is so again, we're gonna zoom into this image until you see individual pixels. So you see that in very small area, like three by three pixels, you have a whole lot of different gray levels. This is a typical high frequency noise. But you can replace the gray value of the center pixel by the average of all those nine, like this. Then you can smooth this out a little bit to reduce the noise level. And there are many different techniques to do this, uh, Gaussian blur being one of them. And when you do noise reduction processing, it reduces the noise level, but since it's essentially smoothing, you're smoothing the edges, you're smoothing the border lines between two different phases as well. So if you go very far, you can get something blur like this. And when this happens, you can apply another image processing method like edge enhancement to bring the border lines back. And as you can see in this example, you can multiply, uh, I'm sorry, you can apply multiple image processing methods to one image data. So for example, this is original data you start with and you can smooth it, then do edge enhancement. And you would do this maybe to make your image look better or you are trying to pronounce some features you're trying to analyze or you're doing this to make the segmentation work better. For example, let's compare this original image and this heavily processed one and apply simple thresholding. Then you get this from original, then this one from the processed image. So you can see that the process the image can give you very clean segmentation compared to the original one. And there are two schools of thought about how you do this. One is you process the original image quite a bit until simple segmentation can give you clean results. That's one way to do it. And the other way to do this is to keep the original image as is. You don't process it but you try to get creative about the way you do the segmentation to get clean segmentation results. And de depending on the background you're from, uh, you might be a little bit surprised by the amount of processing we do to the original image. Processing is essentially data reduction. So whenever you process the original image, you are always losing some information or changing the original data. So I think it's always the best if you don't have to process the original image too much, if you can figure out a way to get clean segmentation without doing it. Now, whether or not you process the original image, you're gonna do some segmentation. So now how do we do those segmentation processings? There are a couple different methods. One is, histogram thresholding. And this is something we looked at at the beginning a little bit. You can also use machine learning 
or deep learning, which is part of machine learning. And you can always do manual painting and there are places for manual painting, but I certainly do not recommend doing this for entire CT image for obvious reasons. Now let's take a look at the histogram based thresholding a little bit further. This is a cross section of a shark tooth. And if you look at its histogram, it looks like this. And you can take this histogram and set a threshold and say everything on the right side is object and the rest of it is the background. Then you can segment this image into the object and the background. And a common way to set this threshold actually is to change the thre threshold value and look at the image and to see what number gives you the results you want. And that works fine, but it is a little bit operator dependent. So if you are looking for more operator independent way of setting a threshold, you can also use binarization algorithms. And there are many different algorithms, but I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So if you use the Huang method, it sets the threshold at nine out of zero to 255 in this case. And this does a good job to just generally separate the sample or the object from the background. The other method that's often used is the Otsu method. And this one sets the threshold at 53. And you can see that this method selects only the high density part of the actual tooth and it selects the cracks as the background. So you can see the different algorithms would do different segmentation. And you might be looking for a way to select only the very high density surface area of the tooth. Then maybe you can use maximum entropy method. This one sets the threshold at 138. So you can see that the only the very high density part is selected. Now, whatever method you use to set the threshold, you will have the object or objects in the background segmented at the result, uh, as a result. Then when you look at this result, and if you like it, then you can move on to the next step. But oftentimes you look at this segmentation and think those objects are a little too big or too small or they're too connected or too separated, then you would have to do some optimization or cleanup of the segmentation. And one of the things you can do is to use some of those morphological operations. Basic operations include erode, dilate, open, and close. We're gonna look at them one by one. So let's say that you got this as a segmentation result. And you think that this is a little too big. It's including the borderline it shouldn't be including. Then you can erode this by a set number of pixels like this. So this is an erode operation. Or maybe you can look at this and say, oh, this is too small. It has to include the borderline area. Then you can dilate this for a set number of pixels to make it bigger. So this is the dilate operation. Or you might get something like this and think this object and this object that they really should be separated, but they ended up being connected. And also I don't like those little dust like pieces. I don't think they're real. Then you can erode them first to separate those objects and also get rid of those dust like pieces. But now those two main objects are too small then you can dilate them back. And since those operations are not reversible, when you do erode first, then dilate second, you can have those two objects separated, but keeping the size the same. And also you can get rid of those dust-like little pieces. So the combination of erode and dilate is called an open operation. And it separates objects and also cleans up some of the dust-like pieces. Now, you might get something like this and say, this object and this object, they really should be connected. 
And also, I don't like those holes. They shouldn't be there. Then you can dilate -like them first to connect those objects and get rid of the holes. Then erode them back to keep the size the same. Now those two are connected and those holes are gone. And this combination of dilate and erode is called close operation and it connects objects and also cleans up some holes. So those are some of the basic operations you can do to optimize or clean up your segmentation. And I wanna show you another technique you can use to clean up segmentation. Let's say that you got those pixels as labeled phase A. And you, you can see different groups of those pixels, so you can label them as separate objects. So you have eight objects belonging to phase A. Then you can check their individual volumes or locations or surface areas and use those parameters to filter out some of the objects you don't want in phase A group. For example, in this case, you look at this image and set some sort of threshold, like the volume needs to be greater than 10 cubic millimeters. Then small objects would be filtered out. So this is another way to clean up segmentation. Okay, to summarize, you start with the raw image and apply histogram-based thresholding. Then as necessary, you can apply some morphological operations or some property or parameter-based filtering. And I've been explaining those techniques using this cartoon version of a CT image. But let's use those techniques on an actual CT data. So this is a cross-section of a foam material. And this is actually not a great image. You see some noise. But let's see if we can segment this image without processing this. So its histogram looks like this in logarithmic scale. And you can set a threshold to separate this into two different phases. And this is the result of a simple thresholding. Now you have the polymer and the air separated. But you see a lot of holes in the speckle, so this is not a very clean segmentation. Let's look at the air of blue pixels. You can do close operation on those pixels to clean it up a little bit. You can do the same thing for the polymer, the yellow pixels, and do close operation to clean it up. Now you still have those little small volume yellow pixels. Now you can filter them out by saying that I don't want small objects. Now you have a pretty clean segmentation between the polymer and the air. And you usually do this by looking at one slice at a time, but you're applying the same techniques to the entire volume to have this raw image separated into the polymer and the air phases. Now you look at this result and might wonder, can you separate those individual cells? And yes, you can. And there are many different ways to do this. Now let's look at this cross section again. When those objects are not too strongly connected, you can apply open operation to separate them. But in this particular case, this cell and this cell, for example, they're pretty well connected. There are multiple pixels or voxels that are connecting those two objects. And when this happens, simple open operation is not gonna separate them. And there are a couple other ways to separate them. And I would like to show you an example of the software Avia from Deer Vision does this object separation. And I would like to use Avia as an example here because the way this program does it is a little less of a black box way. You can kind of see how the program is doing this object separation. So let's see how this goes. And understand this process, um, you need to know two different image processing operations. The first one is distance transform. Distance transform is applied to a binary image like this one. So this one looks like two cells connected. 
And what you do is to assign a number to this pixel, for example, as a distance between that pixel to the closest borderline. If you look at this pixel, you're gonna get a small number because it's close to the borderline. This pixel would get a large number because it's farther away from the borderline. And if you do this for the entire image, you will have this. And this is the distance transform of the original binary image. Now we can look at this image as kind of two wells and apply another operation called watershed. Watershed operation essentially places a water source at the bottom of the well. And you start filling up those wells and you keep going until they almost flood. And when you get to this point, you can see where the two water sources, the orange one and the blue one, meet and draw a line there. And this is how you can figure out where those two connecting wells or cells should be separated. So let's go back to the original image. So this is already segmented into the polymer and the air. And you have two phases. So this is essentially a binary image. So you can apply distance transform and watershed to separate those individual cells. And now you can see all those connecting cells are well separated. So we started from this raw image and it went all the way to this. And when you get to this point, you can analyze whatever parameters you want about those different cells. And then we use those different techniques to get there. And this is quite a bit, there are many, many steps to take. And you might ask, isn't there any easier way? And there are actually easier ways to do this, at least for the segmentation. But I wanted to go through those different techniques because no matter what technique you use for the segmentation, always there are cases you have to do some optimization or cleanup. And those techniques will come in handy when you have to do those cleanup work. Now, let's talk about easier ways to do segmentation. So you can use machine learning or deep learning to do the image segmentation. As we looked at at the beginning, we humans can recognize images and objects very easily. But what about those computers? Well, they can't do it unless they can't do it yet because they don't know how to do it. But by using machine learning, they can learn how to do this. Now, what is machine learning? Machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. And by the way, deep learning is part of machine learning. And as you can see from this diagram, there are traditional programs that are considered to be artificial intelligence, but not machine learning. And one way to look at the difference is to think about what goes in and what comes out from those programs. With a traditional programming, you would have put data and rules and you will get answers out of it. And we are setting those rules. You have to explicitly, logically set the rules and code them to make a traditional programs work. But with the machine learning, you're gonna put data and answers into the machine and the machine is gonna figure out the rules. So the thing is we don't need to come up with the rules. We're gonna just give some example answers like this image is an apple, this one is a monkey, this one is a banana. Then the machine is gonna figure out how to tell the difference. So let's take a look at an example. So this is a conceptual example. So let's say that we have a database of a bunch of animals and we want a program to tell the difference between cats and dogs automatically. In traditional programming, we have to come up with explicit rules. So you might say, okay, if the animal weighs less than 10 pounds and if its tail is longer than four inches, I say that's a cat. And if it weighs more and the tail is shorter, that's a dog. And this is a classification problem. And just terminology wise, 
The weight and tail length are called input features. And the cat and dog are the classes. So anyway, for the traditional programming, you have to come up with those rules about the input features. Now, how do we go around this same problem if we were to use machine learning? Let's make a map of the weight and tail length and pick up some data points from the database and put them on this map. And this is called training a data set. And you will label them with cats and dogs. Then you will ask the machine to look at those data points and figure out a way to tell the difference between the two. And for example, the machine would say, okay, so this is the borderline between the two. If the input is on the left side, it's a cat. If it's on the right side, it's a dog. Now you have a trained machine that can tell the difference between the two. So you can throw a new data point at it and see how it performs. So what about this one? Then the machine would say, oh, it's on the left side, so it's a cat. What about this one? Oh, that's a dog. So this is just as a concept how machine learning works. Now, how does this apply to image segmentation? In the image segmentation, you can have input features like the original image, and you would have classes like polymer and air as you saw in the previous example. Then you can have multiple input features. So you can add, for example, heavily smooth the version of the original image. And this might help the machine to ignore the noise, but you also have the original so that the machine can look at them both. And you set the input features like this in the classes. And what you do next is to take a slice and paint some pixels for air because the machine is going to need some examples and you make a couple different patches you do the same thing for the polymer then you have a set of example pixels labeled as either air or polymer then you tell the machine this is air this is polymer now you look at this and learn how to tell the difference and segment the rest of the image then the machine would come back with this segmentation. So this is a pretty clean segmentation and this happened in just one step. There is no closing operation or anything. So you can see that the machine learning works a lot easier and it does a pretty clean segmentation in just one step. And you can of course do this for the entire volume. And the machine learning is not only easier way to do segmentation, but sometimes it works better than traditional thresholding. And I want to show you an example. This is a CT scan on, on single, about a half a millimeter particle taken out of an orally disintegrating tablet. And if you look at its cross section, you see multiple coatings in different phases. And to say the least, it's pretty difficult to segment this image by traditional thresholding because the same phase has some variation of gray level. But by using machine learning, you can segment this into four phases pretty easily. And once you do this, you can calculate the volume percentage of each phase of coding. You can also analyze the coding thickness distribution and color code it for thin and thick and identify where the coding is thick or where it's thin. So this is an example where the machine learning is not only easier, but better way to do segmentation. Now, that's machine learning. Now, what about deep learning? So what is deep learning? It's part of machine learning. And you might have heard of those terms like logistic regression or random forest. And those are the names of relatively simple machine learning algorithms. And deep learning is not those. When people say that they used deep learning for image recognition or segmentation, they usually mean that they used a neural network. And when you hear the term neural network, you might think of a biological neural network. We all have one. 
and we take an input like looking at somebody's face and I say, oh, that's George, that's the output. And you can look at another face and say, oh, that's Stacy, or I don't know that person. And we can do this all day long. It's really easy. But if you were to sit down and write a code to recognize somebody's face as a George's or Stacy's, that is not a trivial thing to do. So back in about 40s, some people thought that, well, if we can explicitly code how to do what we do, maybe we can make a program that mimics the biological neural network and let it do its thing to learn how we do what we do. So you can put an input into an artificial neural network and take an output and you can have some hidden layers in between. And by the way, most of the neural networks people use for image recognition or segmentation have multiple hidden layers in between. And that's where the term deep learning comes from. But anyway, the beauty of artificial network is that this can handle a lot more complex and sometimes even abstract decision-making process. It can learn how to do what we do. And I wanna show you an example of image segmentation. So this is a CT scan done on a piece of fabric. And if you look at this closely, you see thick fibers, they are coming from the main fabric and also thin fibers. They are coming from the threads going through this fabric. And even with our eyes, we can barely tell the difference between the two. If you look at its cross section, it's a little bit more clear. Those are main fabric, and this is one of the threads. And it's pretty much impossible to use traditional thresholding to segment this image and tell the difference between the main fabric and the thread. Even with the machine learning, uh, it probably is not gonna work. And that's because the main fabric and the thread, they have about the same gray level. So you need a little bit more sophisticated way to segment those two as two different phases. And you can train a neural network to do this. And a well-trained neural network can segment this image like this. And you can see that the main fabric and the threads are clearly separated as two different phases. And this is just one cross section, but this is the original 3D CT scan image. Again, you can barely tell the difference between the main fabric and the thread, but well-trained network can separate them into two different phases. And as you can see here, Deep learning is a very powerful way to do image segmentation. And you might wonder, well then why don't you use it all the time? Well, the thing is, it takes a little bit of work to train a network. So if you're gonna analyze very similar data sets repeatedly, it makes sense to spend a little time to train a network to do the segmentation very well. But if you're gonna analyze something different every day, I think machine learning is probably a better choice because machine learning training doesn't take a lot. So we barely touch the surface of deep learning. If you wanna learn more about it, there are a lot of good resources. And we will put links to those resources I'm gonna show you on in the following slides on the Rigaku webinar website. So you can go there and find those links. The first one, is a lecture by Ian Goodfellow. He is the author of the famous book, Deep Learning. And he gave a talk to go through the first chapter of his book. And this is a very good introduction of deep learning. You can kind of get an idea what it is and how it works. So I highly recommend his lecture and it's on uh, YouTube. If you're interested more in how let's say a program, a software can do image segmentation using deep learning, then I would recommend this recorded webinar by Mike Marsh from ORS. ORS is the company that makes Dragonfly, which is the program I use to create this webinar. And in this recorded webinar, you can see how Dragonfly uses deep learning to do image segmentation. Now, 
to use deep learning or neural network to do image segmentation, you don't necessarily need to understand how exactly this algorithm works. You can just pick a network and train it and use it. But a lot of people who are listening in today are probably scientists or engineers, and you might be just curious about how it works. If that's the case, I would recommend this on the YouTube channel series by Three Blue, One Brown. This series has four YouTube videos explaining neural networks. And I can't take credit for finding this one. Uh, scientists from Deer Vision, Gwen Tron, told me about this a while ago. And since then, I watched the same series multiple times. But Three Blue, One Brown does a great job explaining how neural network works. And he goes through some equations that are used in the program, and you can almost get an idea how this is coded. So if you're curious about the whole algorithm, I would recommend a neural networks series on YouTube. Now going back to how to do the image analysis and segmentation, there are several uh, commercially available programs you can use including Dragonfly by ORS. Again, this is the one I use to create a majority of the examples you saw today. And there are Aviso by Therm Fisher, BG Studio by Volume Graphics, and Avia by DR Vision. This is the one I use to show you an example of object separation. And I2S by DGM. I2S is a cloud-based solution, so not only that you can analyze the images in the cloud, they will store your CT scans and help you manage the database. Those are commercially available tools. If you're looking for something free, you can download Fiji, which is a distribution of ImageJ that includes a lot of plugins made by ImageJ users. So you can use this to play with some image processing methods. And one of the plugins in Fiji is called Wekdan. And Wekdan is a machine learning based image segmentation plugin. So you can use this one to see how it works or maybe just to test if machine learning can do a good job on the images you're working on. Those are the tools you can use to start with a raw image and segment this into different phases and extract all different kinds of quantitative parameters. And I hope that this whole process is less of a mystery to you now, and you found something interesting or useful for your image analysis or research. You just learned what X-ray CT images are, how to segment them, and how to use the segmented results for quantitative analysis. All images you saw today were collected on the Rigaku X-ray CT scanners. And if you're interested in them, please contact your local sales representative. If you don't know who they are, you can go to rigaku.com and contact to see who's in your area. But this is the end of the second part of the webinar series. And next on X-ray computed tomography will be about food and the pharmaceutical applications. It will be on September 25th, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Saving Time or 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Aya. Uh, very, very interesting. And thank you so much for presenting. Um, it appears we have about 10 minutes for question and answer, but it also appears that we don't have any questions. <laughs> but uh, I actually have two. So I could, how long does it take for a, uh, a typical analysis, uh, let's say using one of the uh, machine learning type programs? So it depends on the file size or the image size, of course, but if you were, let's say, to analyze a couple gigabyte of file, um, it takes probably a few minutes to train the machine and segment the whole thing uh, depending on the program you're using and depending on how powerful your computer is. It takes, again, several minutes to 
I don't know, probably 30 minutes is the longest on I have seen so far. So it's a matter of minutes on, if you do very complicated analysis, you know, it could take hours, but mostly in minutes. Okay, thank you. We did get a question that just came in from William. He asked, what software did you use to do the machine learning and imaging processing? I use Dragonfly. Machine learning comes when it's part of the basic uh, Dragonfly package. Okay, we have another question from uh, Mr. Pappy. Um, are all these algorithms integrated in the software? Um, so it depends on which software you use, but again, if you use Dragonfly, all the image processing techniques you saw today, binarization algorithms, uh, machine learning, they're all included in Dragonfly. I believe deep learning is a separate module you're gonna add to it. Okay, I actually have a number of questions rolling in now. Uh, William responds to the uh, first question, uh, how do you get the data set to train the AI? So to train the machine or deep learning, you use the actual image you collected on the CT scanner and you use part of it, let's say one slice or several parts of the slice, and you show on an example which pixel should be what phase to the machine. So you're using the data you are about to analyze. Right, okay. A question from Angela, um, with respect to the processing of power of the computers, do you know if you need a NVIDIA GPU to use the machine learning? segmentation methods, or if an AMD GPU is enough? Uh, so again, it, that depends on which software you use, but you are gonna need a pretty good GPU to do machine learning or deep learning as well. Right, okay. Um, let's see, another one from Cindy. Can this software be used for other than CT? Can you use this for segmentation in you know, electron microscopy as an example? And yes, and I believe this is the case for all the commercially available programs I showed you, and Fiji too. You can use same program to analyze electron microscopy or optical microscopy images as well. Yes. I see, okay. All right, well that should about do it uh, for today, all the time we'll have but we do have the questions, all the questions saved. Um, and we will do our best to get back to any questions we didn't answer uh, shortly. As I said earlier, a recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow. And an email will go out to all the registrants with instructions how to view the recorded presentation. Also note that uh, after the close of the webinar today, you'll be automatically directed to a landing page on the Regaka website with a link to the next webcast, which will be applications in pharmaceutical and food sciences. Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you next time.